Nino no Kuni Wrath of the White Witch has to be my favourite game ever, and when I first played Revenant Kingdom I was surprised at how different it was, so much so that Revenant Kingdom can be easily played and considered a standalone game in its own right, as there is little to tie it to the first game. They are two very different games and today we want to discuss the differences between them to help inform prospective players of what to expect, because if you loved the first game, Revenant Kingdom can come as a bit of a shock to the system. But don't let how different the two games are deter you from playing the other. They are both fantastic games worthy of your time and attention. So firstly, let's talk about some gameplay differences starting with the combat system. Revenant Kingdom ditched the part turn-based part live-action hybrid combat system in favour of full live-action hack and slash combat. This was arguably a great decision to make the game more accessible since the complicated combat system is a common gripe with new Wrath of the White Witch players and it's easy to see why. In Wrath of the White Witch, you can choose to fight using Oliver's magic spells or by sending out tamed familiars. You can run around the battlefield in real time and the action only freezes while you make your selections, meaning you have to have fast reflexes and be quick on the draw to defend against incoming attacks. This style of combat can be quite engaging for some since it allows players to stop the action to think, strategize and access items needed during battle, but it can also feel janky to some people. Those who are used to full live action combat might dislike the turn based aspect which pulls them out of the action. Similarly, those who love turn based combat might dislike the fast paced live action element. Personally, I loved the hybrid combat system in Wrath of the White Witch. I think it is far superior to Revenant Kingdom and has more variety, but that does not mean that I think the combat system in Revenant Kingdom is bad. Embracing live action combat worked very well, although there is less thought needed to participate in battles, making the combat feel a little bit shallow, it is perfectly executed. You can use melee and ranged attacks and execute a variety of upgradable special attacks that feel very impactful. Instead of using fanciful weapons like magic wands and harps, Revenant Kingdom gives each character a variety of more down to earth weapon choices, such as bows, guns and swords. There is magic in Revenant Kingdom, but there is much less emphasis on this. Instead of taming familiars and sending them out into battle, Pokemon style, the player is given access to Higgledy creatures who populate the battle arena and prompt the player when they are ready to unleash an attack. The Higgledies are an interesting idea and they have some very useful attacks such as the ability to conjure a cannon, summon a ball of energy that engulfs enemies and being able to create a healing circle. Instead of taming familiars, you locate Higgledy stones throughout the world, present a treat based on the hint given and then the Higgledy becomes accessible. Although Heather adores the combat of the first game and the concept of familiars, Revenant Kingdom and its Higgledies does seem to have a bigger fan base, and this is likely primarily due to the fact that they removed a lot of elements that frustrated some players and deter potential players of the first game. For example, the creature cage and alchemizing familiar treats. Whether or not you prefer the combat in the first game or the second game, there is no denying that they are both very strong, unique combat systems. Next, let's discuss some gameplay elements that are distinctive to each game, outside the aforementioned Familiars system and Higgledies. The most noticeable new elements in Revenant Kingdom are the inclusion of a city building aspect and skirmishes, which are larger scale battles that occur between two armies. The skirmishes are like Marmite, you either love them or hate them. I really didn't care for the skirmishes and waited until the very end of the game to participate in any skirmish that wasn't compulsory. Which was a huge mistake since the boss battle before the final boss battle is a skirmish. My avoidance of the skirmishes that popped up meant my armies were severely underleveled and I had to grind so badly. If you love the skirmishes then that's great, they are an interesting new element that adds an extra layer to the game and it works well in the context of the story. Since Evan's primary goal is to build a new kingdom and unite other kingdoms under his banner of peace, it makes sense that outside forces would want to challenge him. Speaking of building a new kingdom, the city building was a welcome addition to the game providing a nice respite between quests. It's very fun and satisfying seeing your city of Evermore go from being a pitiful sight of pitched up tents to being somewhere people would actually want to live. Evermore grows into being a place with a bunch of upgradable buildings that provide resources which grant Evan passive and active skills whilst out in the field. 
Sometimes city building can feel like an unnecessary mechanic in games, such as Far Cry Primal, Assassin's Creed Valhalla and others, but in Revenant Kingdom it feels completely necessary and is enjoyable. There is nothing like skirmishes and city building in Wrath of the White Witch. There didn't need to be in the context of the game. What the game does have that Revenant Kingdom does not is the whole concept of soulmates and travelling back and forth from Motorville to the alternate reality where most of the game takes place. That brings us nicely to our next comparison, the world and story. Although we do see Roland being transported to Evan's world at the start of the game, implying that another world exists, there is little reference to Roland's world and it does not play a significant role in the game. Very little is carried over to the second game and it does feel like a different world with mere hints of the before time with Oliver. In terms of story, Revenant Kingdom follows Evan Pettywhisker Tildrum as he suffers a coup and resolves to start a new kingdom and unite other kingdoms in peace. He finds that each kingdom has their own troubles and by solving these he hopes to gain allies. A simple straightforward story. Wrath of the White Witch, however, is more complicated. Following the sudden demise of his mother, Oliver travels to an alternate dimension with the primary goal of saving his mother's soulmate, which he believes will also save his own mother. As the story progresses, Oliver begins to learn acceptance of the permanence of death and begins to care more about macro problems occurring in this other world. He learns he is the pure-hearted one, destined to become a powerful wizard and defeat the great evils that threaten the world. The story of Revenant Kingdom is really lacking in depth for me. Wrath of the White Witch seems so soulful and interesting, whereas Revenant Kingdom's story was shallow and hollow. I think the same thing about the characters. Evan is an extremely two-dimensional weak main protagonist and the other party members we gain throughout the game seem underdeveloped. We don't quite explore their personalities very much or see members of the team build any real relationship. In Wrath of the White Witch, I cared about all the characters. We saw Oliver get to know each member of the team. It feels like they all go through the hardships of the journey together, and there are moments that can truly stir up emotions. I cannot say the same thing about Revenant Kingdom. Something that Revenant Kingdom did better than Wrath of the White Witch is the towns themselves. They are bigger, diverse and more explorable with individual storylines. Although the main story Revenant Kingdom might feel lacking for some, the storylines for each kingdom are very interesting, such as the dodgy gambling and corruption in Goldpaw. Even though I love the towns and dungeon crawling in the first game, Revenant Kingdom includes some additional elements that spice things up and make it feel a little more like a retro Zelda game. For example, moving platforms, using jet streams to access different levels of a dungeon and more. Both games have a large map that is explorable on foot, by fast travelling, in a boat or by flying, but Revenant Kingdom decided to speed up these means of traversal, making it innately superior. Side questing in Wrath of the White Witch is better because there are not as many and, apart from the sometimes repetitive unimaginative side quests such as finding a man's diary lots of times, they feel more engaging and diverse overall. Revenant Kingdom's side questing feels shallow, they're easy to complete and you end up monotonous side quest churning to gain ever more residents and resources. It was nice to see swift solutions in Revenant Kingdom and I swear it's the same dude from the first game. Anyways, moving on, let's talk about alchemy and crafting. In Wrath of the White Witch, alchemy was a factor introduced mid-game that allowed the player to craft HP and MP restoring items, familiar treats, weapons, armour and stat boosting accessories. Although you can get through the game without much knowledge of alchemy, knowing how to create MP restoring cappuccinos and espressos, and better gear, can make things easier for you. Revenant Kingdom ditched alchemy completely and again went for a more down-to-earth approach with stat boosting meals and purchasable and upgradable weapons and armour. Personally I enjoyed the alchemy element of the first game but I can definitely see the advantages of not implementing a mechanic like this in the second game. I can't imagine many people memorise the locations of essential ingredients in the overworld and bother to collect alchemical formulas from nondescript NPCs. The game has a lot of cogs turning and the introduction of alchemy might have been one cog too many for some people. There's a lot we could talk about because these two games are very different, but at least we have managed to go over the main differences, and now for personal opinions. Everyone knows that Heather is our resident Nino Kuni enthusiast. I like the idea of the game and I did play it and got quite far, but as a Pokemon fan it was difficult for me to retrain my brain to think in terms of familiars. I also found the game to be quite slow paced and grindy and I'm not alone in thinking this. A lot of people have similar gripes about the first game, but I loved Wrath of the White Witch and I don't think any game that came after could have replaced it as a favourite. There's nothing I would change about it, except I would completely support an update that adds a new game plus on a much higher difficulty. I've invested hundreds of hours into Wrath of the White Witch and gained the Platinum Trophy and I can't say the same thing about Revenant Kingdom. 
The vibe of both games are very different, and which one you prefer basically comes down to your preferred style of gameplay and how immersed you want to be in terms of story and characters. If you want a whimsical magical game that is closer to a JRPG with grinding, lots of mechanics, combat that is closer to turn based, an epic storyline, memorable characters and a general eccentricity then you will love the first game. If you are looking for a game more grounded in reality that has more recognisable RPG elements with lots of upgrades, more emphasis on hack and slash combat and is arguably more challenging then Revenant Kingdom will likely be your preference. Let us know in the comments which game is your favourite and why. Both games are amazing for different reasons and we want to hear what you think. This is the first gaming comparison video of its kind to be featured on our channel so stay tuned for more videos that take a closer look at remasters, remakes, sequels and games suspiciously similar. I've been Heather and I'm Craig. This is Amalgam Mingle and thank you very much for watching.